Good morning. Welcome to this edition of the Richard Urban Show. We're very happy to have Joyce Smith on today. She's one of the seven candidates for the Board of Education here in Jefferson County. The election, of course, is May 10th, and you can vote for three candidates. So, Joyce, please introduce yourself. Hi, Richard. Thank you for having me on your broadcast. Uh, as you said, my name is Joyce Smith, and I am running for the Jefferson County Board of Education. Um, election uh, is May the 10th. Early voting starts uh, started the 27th and ends on April 27th and ends on May 7th. Um, so I am running uh, because, uh, first of all, I have lived in the county for 30 years and my both of my children um, were raised in the public school system. My daughter is currently uh, in her 17th year teaching in Jefferson County Schools. And <clears throat> there's still the same problems now that there were 30 years ago. And, um, you know, the top priority is teacher pay, trying to keep up with uh, Loudoun County and uh, Maryland and Frederick County, Frederick County, Virginia. And before it was always, we don't have the money, we don't have the money. So we increased taxes, by the way, citizens in Jefferson County pay 80 plus percent of their property taxes to local education. And we have a almost $7 million surplus. So why is teacher pay and service personnel pay still an issue? This last year, well, the, the when I got my personal property tax and I saw the hike in it, I was like, what is going on? And um, so then, you know, I started asking some questions and just kind of watching things. And I, for the last year, especially with the mask mandates, mm. um, a lot of folks, parents were, you know, just crying out and, and just frustrated and it just seems like things just kind of came to a head and I started watching the board meetings and I know I just saw the board members just the disregard for parents and citizens and their concerns now I'm not saying that we're going to be able to please everybody or you know that it's going to be a utopia a perfect world it's not a lot of our funding is tied to the state and the federal uh, government, and our, our schools have turned into government schools because of that, in my opinion. Um, so it's hard to cut those strings, um, but that's why I'm running. The, basically, just the overreach of government, the taxes that we're pouring into it, and we're just having still the same problems that we had 30 years ago. Okay. All right. So it seems like, you've, or you have outlined, you know, the most critical areas you mentioned teacher pay, plus the uh, kind of involvement in the government, all aspects of the, the school, and maybe ex probably most people think excessively. Um, so as a Board of Education member, what do you think your most important role is? Like, what's your most important role? If my, most, yeah. my most important role is a service role. OK, it is to try to get the parents more involved. I think they woke up a lot over the pandemic and they got to see what was their kids were doing or maybe not doing. I think they saw and, and I, I know it was a frustra frustrating time for everyone, but I think it really opened their eyes. I would like to continue that. I would like to get the parents more and more involved. I was a parent in the 90s and I was working and I knew what it was like to go to work and just just get through. But I was still always involved with the kids and, and in school. And I think we've lost as as the government has taken over and kind of said, we're going to, you know, talk about emotions. We're going to talk about your social situation. They've kind of taken that out of the parents uh, response implement surveys. I'm big on surveys. I think that if I know that a lot of teachers and service personnel are afraid to speak out because of retaliation, um, I experienced that a, a little bit uh, when I worked for the school system, and I understand that aspect. I want it to be open. I want it to be open. I don't want uh, staff to be afraid uh, to to voice their opinions. Yeah. And to and their concerns um okay so, can i interject one thing or 
like a related thing? Sure. Yeah, like so the yeah, I think what you or would you like to comment more about like the activism of the school board? Like of course we're aware that the after the January 6th a President Trump rally, a couple of uh, employees were suspended and then some 30 employees were threatened with suspension or well, I guess actually termination was on the table just because they went to political rally. I mean, right. if that's not crazy, I don't know what is. I mean, do you have any comments on it? Well, I do. And I was with the two bus drivers that went there. And I guess I was a former employee of uh, Jefferson County Schools and Human Resources for 10 years. And um, I, I think that they were maybe a little bit, I mean, I can't prove any of this, but it was funny that we were all three together and then they get called in two days later and threatened. So I, I want to stamp that out. I do not care what your views are. I do not care what your opinions are. Every employee and staff member, this is a free country. You are free within a simple phone call to these two folks would have cleared up any, we were on the bus on our way home. We had no idea any kind of insurrection had happened. All they had to do was call these two bus drivers and say, hey, you know, we've had a concern. Can you tell us what's get what happened? Blah, blah, blah. And it would have been done. It would have been over with. There is no reason that any employee or staff member should feel threatened by their political views as long as they're within the within the law. So and the only way to do that is to gain be more active as a board member. These board members, I've watched them. They rubber stamp everything the superintendent puts on the table. They question, there's one board member that questions and she gets shot down. She just gets, you're either going to, it's their way or the highway with them. Right. You're talking and about Donna, not, Donna and Joyce. Yeah, look, Donna look Joyce. more independent. Yeah. And um, I, I, we're, I, I just don't want to have that kind of relationship with the taxpayer and the citizen and the children and the parents. Right. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. A lot of activism. Well, one parent was asking me about like, you know, as you know, the National School Board Association labeled parents terrorists. And there was, um, as, as far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong, West Virginia still associates with that National School Board Association. Like, should uh, West Virginia withdraw from that? Or if I'm wrong, correct me. No, I, I think you are correct. There is a lot of talk and a lot of legislation out there. And I haven't followed up because I've been busy door knocking, but I think they still are associated. And with that being said, before I forget, I would like for your viewers to go to um, Salem Now. And it is a platform where you can rent or buy uh, uh, conservative documentaries. I went to see one particular, it's called Whose Children Are They? Okay, oh, and excellent. you can rent it for seven. Yeah, S did you see it? I saw it in the theater, yeah. Yeah, and that will tell you why uh, uh, unions have, in this, and the National School Board Association, we need, to, we need to either revamp that program or cut ties. I mean, it, you, you cannot, you cannot claim that concerned parents and citizens are terrorists. It's just, it's it it it, it that it's just ludicrous. I agree. I agree. What about you're talking about the tax? And I've noticed that. Well, <laughs> yes, we all noticed it. You know about the uh, huge amount of taxes, like forty. I believe about forty. You're saying eighty percent of property tax goes to schools. I think I saw on your. Uh, I think the website or in some of your information or you were saying, but anyway, 40% um, I think is so-called excess levy. So, mm -hmm. well, two part question. One, how can we increase transparency of finances? Because I know I've looked at that statement they put like in the spirit of Jefferson each year. It says, oh, okay, salaries. I don't remember the exact amount, 13 million. Well, whose mm -hmm. salaries? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's totally like no help at all. Well, you know, give, give us a specific breakdown. So, and the, um, I wonder, do you, 
by the way, anyway, it seems pretty obvious. I don't support the excess levy. And like you were talking about a surplus of seven million. Well, hello, taxpayers work for that money, you know, whether they're parents or tax, uh, just uh, other, you know, citizens. And it seems like there's an entitlement mentality. The administration, I believe I also saw in the article I was reading, I'm sorry, I don't remember which source I was to prepare. I was looking at a lot of different things, but that a lot of the, um, you were saying, and a lot of the mis new administrators were hired and that I know already the administration was extremely top heavy already. Like we had some 50 some administrators for 9,000 students, probably less now because the enrollments declined. And in Kanawha County, they had like 68 administrators for like 20,000 students. So it's extremely top heavy and we have positions like diversity directors and this and that. So if you're elected, would you try to one, increase transparency? And also what about this like huge spending? Would, can we reel that in? What do you think? Absolutely, we can reel it in. I, when I worked there, I saw a lot of waste. Um, and, you know, it, it, it goes along with what I've always heard. Oh, get a government job. That's a gravy job. Well, it is. It's turned into a lot of entitlements. It's turned into a lot of perks. Now, I'm not saying that folks are not due a decent and reasonable salary. And yes, we are in a complicated area in the Eastern Panhandle compared to the rest of the state, which is one of the reasons we have some delegates that are uh, up for election. And we have discussed, you know, it wasn't until the 70s that the federal government was even involved in education. OK, it used to be it was at a minimal at the state level, but it was more local. We want to work on achieving that. Let's get it back local, okay? Um, and let's be in transparent. There's a lot of things that can be done with the budget. You know, we all know figures can be manipulated to look good in any aspect, okay? Right. They just can. That's the beauty of numbers, all right? But what is not manipulative is line items that specifically say, what this is for, you know, and give reasons. And I happen to know that in the Weavis program that's run by the state, there are uh, fields that you can you can put in there for repairs on the maintenance building, repairs on whatever school building. You can put in it. So it's small things like that can that can really help with the transparency. Um, can a board of five people do it? No. This is my message to folks. You've got to get involved in education and help us. You've got to, we've got to form committees. They have the, it's called the Local School Improvement Council. Okay, during COVID, they didn't do much. It's for each school and they kind of bring their concerns for the school and you know what they can do to upgrade. There are no citizens or parents on those councils. It's all employees and teachers, which I'm not saying that's, that's oh, fine, but Let's get some outside input. Let's draw the community back into education and get them involved. Yeah. And help make some of these things transparent. So you, meant you, you can go into the finance uh, department and set up a, a meeting and you can sit down. One of the existing, one of the incumbent board members said that they'd be welcome to sit down and, and sit. The problem is it's so convoluted. People just throw their hands up. So we have to make it easier somehow. Yeah. The salary thing isn't transparent, though. I mean, I remember well, the spirit when they, when I think one year ago, I believe it was one year ago. I could be yeah, wrong. back in August. Yeah. They mm -hmm. voted themselves big increases just before. Uh, I think that was just before Donna Joy came in. Right. Uh, maybe that was two years ago. I'm sorry. But in any case, they voted themselves these large increases, you know, as much as like $20,000 increases for the administrators. And that's what I mean. And then they say, oh, we have to have this excess levy, you know, and then they got, you know, all these top heavy positions. This is like, I believe you're saying, you know, just plain wrong, I think. Well, it is. And I'm not, I'm not saying that people don't deserve raises. They do. But and, and if they haven't gotten a raise for 15 years, which is what one of the incumbents said at one of the forums, well, you've been in there for eight years. Why is that? Why are you all of a sudden now taking care of that? Why, you know, 
Uh, so. Well, also know. that it's so hard to find out. So anyway, we can move along from that. But um, yeah, I think that is an, an important thing. But, well, let me just add one more thing really quick. The state, the, you can get a printout from the state uh, Board of Education of everybody's salary, every employee's salary. So that's, that's it's the matter of getting it and, 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 and um, advertising it. Uh, okay, yeah. Well, I think they had a hard time finding out about the increases. So it took them like three months to figure out what, um, who got what. Which oh, shouldn't, yeah. they should be, since those are public service jobs, not like some private company, it shouldn't be a secret, in my opinion. No, it should not. I think in anyone's opinion. And I believe if you take a service public job like that, you go into it knowing. And you should, you know, like anybody's expected to earn their their uh, pay. I never had a problem with people knowing what I made when I worked at the board office. I, that's taxpayer. That's what I make. Right. The idea of the service. Yeah, that is, that is very, very, very important. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so one thing that's close to my heart I wanted to mention, which is also a very interesting thing, our nonprofit deals with education to help you to succeed by staying absent from sex before marriage and from drugs and alcohol. So we have been doing that many, many years. Um, in six years ago, I, we did it a lot in DC metro area. I've been out here six years, but also, you know, I'm hoping that will be introduced locally. So I actually, um, was at the meeting right after the January 6, 2021. And also that meeting, they were reviewing sexual health curricula. So I stated that we should adopt curricula that are abstinence centered versus, you know, so-called comprehensive sex ed. So one Mr. Edward Belmont, also I think so, Willie Belmont, a teacher said, no, you know, that's old school to paraphrase, that's not going to happen. Later, that same teacher in September was indicted the very same teacher for having sex with a 17 year old student. And uh, he's um, the grand jury, or not indicted, but arrested, indicted him in January. I guess his trial is pending. So that's very obviously concerning to say the least. So, anyway, the actual question is you know, do you support like those kind of directive or absence centered, uh, you know, sexual education materials or health education? And um, would you support at least offering that as an opportunity or alternative, if not the main focus for like the um, health education? Well, in op absolutely. And because, and it, you know, they can call it old school. My belief is, and that's fine, but we saw where that old school attitude in his uh, opinion got him. So, you know, I call it as I see it. There are some things that need to change. There are some things that do not need to change. Children having children, in my opinion, has never been a good idea, ever. Okay, so now we've got a generation and that when that starts and that started back in the 90s, 80s, 90s, well, illegitimate children have been going on, you know, that you're never going to eradicate that. 100%. That doesn't mean people are bad. And and it, it just means you get caught up. But when a society, to me, gets the main focus on, oh, it's okay, it's no big deal, that's where you start having problems. Yeah. Now, I believe that you, you know, I would love being a Christian conservative, would love to see, you know, abstinence with teenagers and young folks, you know, not even be talked about until marriage. I know that's not in, in the home. Okay. That's the parents. That's one of the issues is the trans, the, the transgender, the, the pronouns, he, him, me, she, the sexual orientation, that type of thing does not belong in the public schools. But since it is, again, a part of a survey to see what the parents want, the community, how do we want to handle this? How do we want to turn this ship around? Do we want to offer uh, programs of abstinence and, you know, real, there's biologically and under God, there's two sexes, male and female. Um, right. Where do you want to go with that? So absolutely, I, I would be open to that. I think it's very important. Yeah. Well, one thing I've mentioned with some of the other candidates I've interviewed, like in the 90s, 
for those uh, like federal funding for these kind of programs, it was stated that you know the expected standard for uh, ch school age children is you know not to have have sex. You know, school age children should not be having sex, and that was under Bill Clinton, and that was just an accepted standard. And so, you know, how do we like you're saying? I think how do we get to this point now where that anybody would even question that, you know what I mean? That school-aged children should be having sex, you know? Well, if you, you saw the movie, you saw what they're doing in right. the school. You saw, I, I, whether I'm elected or not, I'll fight, I'll fight that that never enters Jefferson County schools. I'm, I'm, I'm shocked that it's in any public school in our country. Yeah, but. I hear you. Yeah, definitely. Um, Yeah, so, what was your opinion like on the whole um, thing of the mass mandates and how that dragged on until very recently, you know, of how the school board handled it? How, what would have you done? Well, again, that's a pretty big societal issue. That was worldwide. It wasn't just countrywide, it was worldwide. Um, personally for myself, I investigated it when it first started happening and I researched and researched and and I found that you know nobody disputed the fact that this was a a virus or whatever it is had a 99 percent recovery rate that's that's a huge recovery rate to me if you're if you're healthy and and the very beginning children weren't even affected so it it as it grew to be this monster to me out of control and the fact that they took one doctor, Dr. Reedy, one doctor's opinion, instead of gathering all the science, all the doctor's opinions that were out there and getting all the facts, I would have presented it to the community as a whole and asked them what their opinions were. And if the majority said, we want masks optional, obviously, if you feel safer and you want to uh, a mask, wear one, but to make it a mandate on a right. virus that's got a 99% recovery rate and children aren't even supposed to be affected, it was just, that's what really um, saddened me that they did not listen to the community. They, they did not listen to the parents' concerns. They just, that it was the money, it was getting the money, and that was all they were concerned about. And, and that's just not going to fly. If anything like that ever comes down the road again, it will be a community decision. It won't be one superintendent and one doctor. It just won't. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, that's clear. Um, on another topic, like the idea of um, school choice, in other words, you know, and this is, I guess this will have two parts too, because um, enrollment across the board has declined. I haven't heard the statistics for Jefferson County, but I'm sure it's declined due to, you know, people partially due to COVID, but also more people wanting to homeschool, or uh, I guess we don't have a charter school right now, or a private school, but possibly in the future, there'll be a charter school. Do you support different types of uh, education other than public schools? I mean, the parents' right to choose those? Absolutely. I had to take, I had to do that myself. My daughter was a, she wanted to be a school teacher from the time she was born and she sailed through public school and did fine. My son, good time, Charlie, he was the class clown. So when he reached uh, middle school, I could see he, the first year it was not going well. And I put him in a Christian school until he, you know, graduated it just the way it had to be. So that was my choice. You know, unfortunately there, I was able to do that because their father um, was deceased. And, um, you know, I had funding for that. So this Hope Scholarship, I think, is a great tool. Um, I'm actually a treasurer on a Blue Ridge Christian co-op that, you know, we, I want, ev here's the thing, every child that is born is going to be a part of society somehow, some way. Right now, with the public school system in the divisive situation that it's in and parents pulling those children that are homeschooled need socialization they need something else if we care about every child we in my opinion we have to be 
for school choice until the public school system can get to a point where folks want to reintroduce their children back into the public school. Okay. Yeah, and that's another also interesting thing with an enrollment declining, then, you know, should the, again, the board be hiring all these new positions and stuff, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But anyway, I'm glad to hear your no, position and building, on that. And building, yeah, and building schools. Right. They're not, you know, not thinking uh, properly, holistically, or whatever you say. Talking about the um, uh, one more topic, and I guess we're coming close to the end of the interview. Uh, Miss Gibson, um, so her contract, uh, some other candidates are saying probably would be renewed by the current board. But uh, I guess what I'm asking you, would you support renewing Miss Gibson's contract if you were a school board uh, member? Well, as I understand, her contract was renewed just last month for the, another four years. Okay, I hadn't heard. I was looking for that. I hadn't yes. uh, seen that it was voted on yet. But, yes, um, yes, I'm. I'm pretty sure. I'm, I believe it was, and so she is renewed by the current board for another four years. We've been asked that question several times. I've been right. asked that question several times, and it, I would be remiss to say. I wouldn't renew her contract. She has four more years. One thing that I, you know, the board of education does her review. The board members who hired her does her reviews. So they would be hard pressed to not, in my opinion, renew her contract unless there was some kind of gross, um, you know, uh, situation, um, grossly negligent situation, because that's a reflection on them. They hired her. OK, I get that. However, I think incorporating, again, the parents, the citizens and the staff review of the superintendent would be helpful with the board making that decision. And I believe if elected or when elected, I'll say that if there is an outcry from the citizens, the parents and the staff, to, for that to be, you know, looked at again, I think the board would have would be remiss if they didn't. Okay, fair enough. But that would have to be that would have to be a, you know, obviously a, a board decision, and the majority would have to, you know, make that decision. Okay. Well, is there anything uh, as we're coming for the end of this interview? Anything else you'd like to share with the uh, the voters about uh, why they should? vote for you as one of their three choices on May 10th? Well, I'm just going to recap my qualifications. Um, I am retired, so I have, I just have a, you know, little part-time job. Um, I am retired, so I have the, uh, the time for the commitment. I believe it is going to take a lot of time and a lot of energy, um, a lot of working with delegates on all levels of government. Um, it's going to take a lot of research, it's going to take a lot of time in the board office researching things, doing surveys, getting the, you know, plan for transparency at all the schools. I would like to see the um, board meetings at all the different schools to give folks a chance to come to them. Um, I think it's going to take a lot of work to get the public school system turned around. Um, I did work in HR for 10 years. I subbed as a bus driver and I subbed as a teacher. I and continue to fight for public education, whether I'm elected or not. So, but I feel that I can um, do the best service on the board. Um, and I would just ask everybody, especially in Shenandoah, all over the county, just do your research on the candidates and please, please, please get out and vote. The Board of Education is a very, very important, it's the basis of our society. I'll second that. It's very important to vote. So don't don't skip voting for the board of three board of education members of your choice. Well, uh, Joyce, thank you so much for being on today. I hope this is helpful. We're going to get it up on as a um, podcast as well as a video. So I thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for having me. And you have a great day. OK, you too. So thank, thanks for joining us today on this edition of The Richard Urban Show.